I'm Reed Becker here in Bourne. We're getting set for Game 1 of the Championship Series between the Bourne Braves and the Brewster Whitecaps, but I just ran into legendary MLB reporter Peter Gammons. Now, first, Peter, you're here for the series. Any thoughts on what team's going to win? No, not really, because at this point of the season, I mean, it's it's so hard to know, you know, um, who gets hot, who doesn't get hot. And I think the other thing this year, it's been so difficult because... I mean, like, Brewster's been through 60-something players. I think Bourne's been through about 50. The whole thing that Major League Baseball has done to the Cape League has made it so much more unpredictable. I mean, you just you have no idea sometimes who's going to be playing and who's not going to be playing. So, uh, But uh, I think it's pretty remarkable that, that, that to get here now and for, for both teams to play so well down the stretch, I think it tells us a lot about both of them. So. Well, I just have a follow-up on that because, first of all, it feels like with the Cape League, it's whoever has keeps the most guys and whoever gets hot, as you said. But also, I mean, you mentioned Major League Baseball. I mean, we talked about, obviously, there's a draft that takes place, which might take some players away. But also, what about, how do you feel about the Team USA then? Because that also takes some guys away, no? Well, um, they take far more players than they're going to use, which um, is an insult to the players. I think it's an insult to scouts because... Um, if they're not playing games and just going to watch them work out, that's not how baseball's played. And uh, secondly, they have no regard for, if you really want to see players develop, see them playing games. Um, Isn't that what they're doing here? That's what they're doing here. Yeah. But, you know, the way they take guys away, and so it's, uh, I think there's just a lot of, like, they, when they had that sh uh, thing in, in San Diego where they had all the, the, the showcase type of things, they're having long jumps and standing jumps. I mean, that has nothing to do with baseball. I mean, Cam Collier was at, at, at uh, Katua and his father played in big. He was a first round pick. And he said to me, why would they want to watch me play baseball games rather than do things that are on the NFL combine? I said, because their idea of um, judging athletes uh, isn't by the game they play, it's by what they do on the NFL combine where those individual skills play and they don't play in baseball. So if you could speak to Rob Manford right now, what would you tell him then? Come to a, a Cape League game see, see, and see a couple of them. You know, come back, if you're coming back from uh, Nantucket or wherever you're staying, um, go to games in about three or four places. But I, other than one guy in the commissioner's office, um, and Theo Epstein who occasionally works in there, I don't think anybody in the commissioner's office has ever been to a game in the Cape. You know, is it because of the tradition? Because you're saying they're just looking at it with what skills can they do by jumping, and that's not baseball, you're saying. Is it then you just don't get the tradition of the Cape League? No, I think that is you're just playing highly competitive games. I mean, guys, you see a lot of people come to this league, and they have no idea how good they are. And they come here, and all of a sudden, I'm actually in Falmouth in 97, Mark Moeller goes out there and... I stop on the way home, see him pitch as a second start, and uh, Mark, I don't think, I think he pitched 30 innings at Michigan State in his sophomore year. The freshman was ineligible. He led Big Ten in hitting as a first baseman center fielder, and that night he threw, I think, a one-hitter and was unbelievable. And he had then ended up as the best pitcher in the league, and it was the second pick in the draft. And he had a great career, started an all-star game, but Sometimes when you play against really good competition, it brings it out of you. You, you end up playing a lot better. And, and uh, um, I think even though um, coach at Mar uh, hitting coach at Maryland, and who was very close to the, the, who, the guy that runs the whole hitting program for the Dodgers, knew Matt Shaw very well. Um, a lot of people, well, you know, he's not, he doesn't run like uh, such and such. Or, He's just a b baseball player and really good one. He's going to be a really good major league player. They're saying that about him already? That he doesn't play like this or play like that? Yeah, I hear that, but I don't care. I mean, like... Is that I because of baseball analytics? Baseball Amer America had a list as the 80th best prospect for next year. Well, wrong. That's okay. I mean, uh, you know, they sometimes take two guys. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. I think the White Sox took him in the draft. And when he... The, 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 when he went up to the stage in uh, in New Jersey at the MLB set at the at the draft 
he did you know fl did a, a, a complete flip and I was oh this guy's going to be great well I think he hit 156 <laughs> in the big leagues now he hit about 220 in triple a and is now out of baseball well now you've been here around Cape Cod it feels like forever now but who has been the best I guess pitcher or player overall that you've seen in Cape Cod Pitcher would definitely be Billy Wagner. 1992, the Brewster Whitecaps. He was, and he's going to the Cape League Hall of Fame this, uh, this winter, which is a good thing. But he's tru he was truly, nobody could touch him. I mean, it was actually almost ridiculous how good he was. Best player? I'd say Darren Erstad um, with Falmouth in, the, in, uh, in 94. He was a, truly a great player. And uh, it was funny, he used to practice his punting because he was a punter and special teams captain in Nebraska. Uh, he would practice punting, then he'd go out and hit 450 or what, and then he was the number one pick in the draft. So, Now, with the MLB, we have to just pitch it. Let's just move over for a little bit to the MLB. Second half of the season now, which baseball team in the MLB do you think is the most complete or has a chance come October? I think the best team right now is Houston. Um... As we've seen in the last month, um, the problems the Yankees have in terms of the, A, their starting pitching, but much more important, that they're one of the worst base running teams. I think they're 28th in base running. In it feels like team. earlier this season, though, they, got, they improved it. Yeah, but um, it's really fallen apart as the season's gone along. I mean, it, it, last night was one of the great games ever watched, but... They also had five incredible blunders on the bases that cost them the game, so they lost one nothing in 13 innings. What, what uh, is your favorite? What, what would you say about the Yankees, though? I mean, what about the Montgomery trade? What do you think about that? Um, a lot of Yankee fans were not happy about that, and they didn't well, replace I it. it. I mean, I know why they wanted Bader. They want a defense in the outfield, and they want to they want to get put less pressure on Judge for his legs and and so forth. But I mean, depth pitching. Depth. Montgomery's a good pitcher. He throws strikes. You now it's. Uh, I think sometimes people get carried away with velocity and so forth. I mean, you look at, at the Dodgers and Anderson's thirteen and one, and he just throws strikes. Um, he's a little arrogant, which is a good thing. And uh, which doesn't really happen. It feels like today. No, I mean, he, and he, there he is. He gets let go by three teams last year. Goes to the Dodgers, signs for eight million dollars, and he's thirteen and one. Yeah, you know, they, and they have a guy in the ninth for the ninth round, who's also thirteen and one. They're playing without Bueller, without without uh, Kershaw, and they still have the best pitching in baseball. Now, as we wind down here, I just want to ask: You've been covering baseball forever. What is your most favorite memory when you've been covering baseball? Louis Tiant in the fourth game in Cincinnati. 1975 when he threw 173 pitches and popped up Joe Morgan for, for the final out after having runners on second and third, one out with a one run lead, five consecutive innings and getting out of every one of them. It was the best game I've ever seen pitched. Do you have any, as we, last question here, any specific memory or story from, from covering games and interviewing players, locker rooms, anything that sticks out to you? One of my favorites was um, in 78 when the Red Sox were in the middle of their slide the Yankees came from 14 back and on, uh, they played the four game series the Boston Massacre and on Saturday Dennis Eckersley who was, won 20 games and Ron Guidry who won 25 were matched up bases loaded, two outs nothing nothing in the fourth inning and uh, Lou Pinnell hits a little pop fly into right field and, but Evans was hurt, Remy was hurt they had a whole confusion, ball drops couple runs score then he gives up a double two more runs seven runs they lose after the game everybody is surrounding the only person in the locker room was Frank Duffy the ba second baseman but he was a backup infielder who was pressed to do uh, service because Remy was hurt and uh, the ball hit him and then and uh, accuracy went over there had to be a hundred writers because it was the Yankees Red Sox mm -hmm. and he's pulling them off saying hey come over and interview me I have the L. I hung the I, I hung the uh, three-two slider to Bucky Dent. I did, and it was one of the great teammate things. And for about, I'd say, ten years, Frank Duffy used to send me a note on Christmas Day every uh, on Christmas every year, just reminding that's one of the greatest uh, greatest things uh, a teammate's ever done. And I I did spent 
13 years flying into Cleveland every winter and working in their rookie development program. And I told that story every year. And the, the young players never stop um, marveling at, the, at, at that. I mean, here's Eckersley going. He's got 20 wins. He's going for an ERA title. And he's, he's protecting Frank Duffy. It was, it was too great a moment. Now, last question. I did lie. Uh, You've been around baseball for so long. Who is the most the favorite player to deal with as a media member, would you say? Or, or manager, either one. Um, I think that's hard. Um, it would be either Dustin Peroy or George Brett. Any manager? Um, and how come, I guess? Well, I would probably say Alex Cora, having known him since for 21 years, and uh, he's one of the smartest people I've ever dealt with in baseball, and uh, one of the most sincere. And his ability to to um, understand and um, give all due credit to players is is amazing. I wish that. Uh, they have more front office people who could do that, but they don't. So it's uh, everything's up to Alex, and they're obviously going to finish last. Well, and what about what is it about George Brett and Pedroia that stuck out to you then? Well, Brett Brett played as hard as anybody I ever saw, and he was always really a lot of fun. He's a real character. Um, Every time he went out of the box after he hit a ball, he, he thought double, and he played like that. And I mean, outfielders who didn't hustle on that turf at Kansas City on a hot Sunday afternoon, he could hit a ground ball up the middle of the center field and be a double because he played hard all the time. And Peroya just had the joy of playing was so incredible. He was so funny. And in, those, in, this, in this century, Ortiz was their star, but they had two leaders. The first half when they won two World Series, it was Varitek. In the second half, they won two World Series, it was Pedroia. They were the two guys who made the biggest difference in the Red Sox. And made one, they each made as big a difference on the team as, as almost any players I ever saw. One more question. You can yell at me afterwards. <laughs> Anything specific that you remember, uh, biggest memory with the Yankees, when you, when you, if, when you saw the Yankees at all? Um... I think, I mean, there were certain things, like, you know, certain times, the emotion that the fans had for Paul O'Neill, who was one of my favorite players ever, but um, I think really it was how Derek Jeter prepared every day. It was very simple, and he just, I mean, he never took extra, he, he used the same bat he got the day he reported to the rookie ball in 1992 in the Gulf Coast League, and it was... He didn't say very much, but he just, how he prepared and how the other players knew that he was always there. It's funny that the analytics showed him to be not as good. The Yankees don't win without Derek Jeter. Oh, absolutely. Have you been able to see the documentary, The Captain on ESPN, mm -hmm. about any, what are your thoughts on that? It's good. Um, he never really let people in, though. I mean... Well, uh, interesting that you say that, because they talk about A-Rod and Jeter, and he says, I mean, when you look back at it, I think A-Rod kind of like apologized about what his comments were back then when he was still in Seattle and what Jeter being the captain but now but he also said I'm not going to take it back he still believe in that well, what are your thoughts on that um, Alex is an actor he should have been with the, he should have been one of the three greatest players of all time and he, he, he isn't and it's too bad but um, do you think the steroids played a role in that no I think his, I think his insecurity was so insecure that um, and it was Every player that played with him was embarrassed by the, the way he acted about Jeter. Jeter just... Yeah, Even later button. into his career? Oh, yeah. He never learned you're saying that. Well, his career, it was, it was, there was never without all that, all yeah. the steroids and everything else. I mean, he was suspended three times, so... Um, it, it, it's all about Alex. It's not about the respect. He loved the game, but he, the ego was kind of sad. Well, Peter, I appreciate it so much. You're the best. That's legendary MLB reporter Peter Gammons. I'm Reed Becker here in Bourne at the Cape Cod Baseball League. Thanks.